Okay, so this is going to be our notes on animals, and uh, we've been talking so far about all the six kingdoms of life. We looked at bacteria, the two types of those. We looked at fungi, and uh, we're now going to look at animals. And this is going to be our main focus for the rest of the year, do, do some dissections and so on. And I've had you complete a reading and uh, prep you a little bit for this. Uh, and when you're done with this, you're going to do a, a graphic organizer on animals from everything you've learned about from the readings and the videos that you watched. So if we're going to define what an animal is and what makes it different than other organisms, we're going to list these characteristics. What are the defining characteristics? And uh, the first one is that it's a eukaryote. And uh, that means that it has uh, membrane-bound organelles. It's a more complex cell. It's multicellular. Uh, we can put that stuff in. I can't write too good with this, though. So multicellular, we'll just put multi. Okay, it has organelles. And so on. And it, those are the two ones. It has a nucleus, all those kind of things that makes it different than a bacteria cell. So each one of these characteristics that we look at is going to help separate it from other organisms. And there's many other characteristics actually from animals that separate it from bacteria, but this one also helps the multicellular part, helps separate it from protista, which we're not going to probably look at too close unless there's time at the end of the year if we get through all our dissections. This is a very important one, eukaryotes. Uh, it's just a eukaryotic cell and, and so on. So keep that one in mind. Uh, then heterotrophic, and heterotrophic, you should know this, means that it eats other organisms to get its energy. If you're not heterotrophic, you're a plant. So this one just separates all the plants. And so all the things that make a plant a plant, an animal doesn't have. Uh, so if you're a plant, though, you'd be called autotroph. But heterotrophic organisms are like carnivores. They're herbivores. They can be omnivores. And you should kind of know what all those mean. Uh, but some eat plants, so for herbivores, some eat other organisms or meat, they're carnivores. We even have detritivores that eats dead decaying matter, and so on. But uh, all of those are heterotrophic. They eat other organisms to get their energy. The third one is multicellular and tissues. Okay, so this one kind of ties back into uh, the first one. Because they're eukaryotic, they're also multicellular. And then they have tissues, and if you remember, we have the types of tissues. There's muscle, let's see if I can learn to write this mouse. So they have muscle tissue, they have epithelial, which is skin, or covering tissue, they have nervous tissue, and so on. And most of these organisms we're going to look at have that. We first initially start looking at these animals, though, they're not going to quite have this yet. But then they develop it as we start to look at annelids. And the first dissection we're going to do annelids, you'll see they have all of these. Okay. And except sponges, and you can even say some of the worms, the, the more primitive worms, and even cnidarians don't have tissues as, as well. And we'll kind of learn what those are. Also, they're capable of movement. So that doesn't mean they can always move, because you'll see these guys right here, sponges, they can't move most of the time. And even if you looked at a sponge, you might think it's a plant. And, but it's not. It's an animal because it fits all these characteristics. It's eukaryotic. It's heterotrophic. Uh, it has multi, it's multicellular. And many, for many years, they thought sponges were plants. But they're actually animals because they don't do photosynthesis. A big separator. But also capable of movement. And even though a sponge for most of its life and some other organisms for most of their life, they're not moving. Uh, there is a time in their life when they can move and uh, use that to their advantage. And we'll talk about that when we get there. So capable of movement. The fifth one is sexual reproduction. And then this is really kind of a later one here. We're going to talk about this. And we've talked about it a little bit with, you know, sperm and egg. Uh, but some of them also uh, can do this asexual as well, which means they just butt off like budding. And excuse my writing. So bud, budding, and 
even like a sea star where they just lose a piece and they can regenerate it. Kind of like asexual, similar to it. But most, even the sponges that can produce uh, gametes, which are sex cells, which would be a sperm and an egg, and do sexual, sexual reproduction as well. So although some of the more primitive ones, when we first start, when we first start looking at them, like sponges and cnidarians and thenaria, they have asexual, but also they have sexual. And this, this allows for diversity, if you remember from genetics. We keep going. So diploid, which means in their nucleus, they have two sets of chromosomes. So they have one from their mother and one from their father. So we have this. This is why you have two sets, because you have one from the mother there first, and then you have one from the father. Okay, and that's a really good thing. Um, when you get further, when you get further in high school in biology, we'll kind of talk about this. It's really an important thing. Uh, it allows for a lot of the processes in an organism to occur. More, the more complex ones. So this extra set of chromosomes is very helpful. And there's even some organisms like, um, I'm trying to think, octa. The strawberries, plants, they have eight sets of chromosomes. So for every chromosome they have, I think they only have 15, but they have eight sets. So then they end up having uh, what is that 40, 132 or something, uh, or 130. So we, all, we end up with humans have 36 and all different organisms. They have different numbers, but they're diploid 2. The dip there, DI, is 2. Two sets of chromosomes. That's very unique for animals. Okay, plants don't have that. Other organisms do not have it. Okay, then they do not possess rigid cell walls. This is a plant thing. Plants need these to help them stay up and uh, protect them. Uh, and because of that, plant cells are square. Animal cells, though, are circular, so you can kind of see they don't have cell walls because they're like this, and they're not like this. If you look at a plant cell, it's kind of square. It's not like that. That's a plant cell. And this thing here comes because it has a cell wall. So do not possess rigid cell walls. And that's really the seven main things. So if you look at any organism, is it an animal or not? Well, is it a eukaryote? Is it heterotrophic? Does it eat other organisms? Uh, is it multicellular? Does it have some tissues, some organs, etc., so on? And is it capable of movement sometime during its life? Most can move most of the time, but there's a few like the sponges and the more primitive ones that only move at certain times. Uh, in sexual reproduction, does it use gametes to reproduce, or can it? And then diploid, two sets of chromosomes, and then no cell walls. If you look at each one of these seven characteristics, that makes it so that uh, separates it from all the other six kingdoms or five kingdoms. Okay, so then if we keep going, there's also some other important things to remember about these animals. There's two main groups: vertebrates and invertebrates. And if you see here, we're in this one. Vertebrates really an important part is their chordates, and a lot of times they say it's just the backbone thing, but it's more than that. We might not go too much into that. But a backbone is an important part of it. Uh, there are some organisms that are chordates that do not have backbones. So, uh, although that's an important part of it, it's not a requirement. Or the backbone as we think of it. Uh, they have something similar to it, a notochord. But, uh, but you see, 3% of all animals are vertebrates. Everything else is 97% are invertebrates. And these are things without backbones. They have some other kind of skeleton than an internal skeleton. <laughs> and 97% uh, of them, that's a large number. This is mainly driven by the insect part of it. Uh, all I think it's 70 some percent of invertebrates are insects. So they really drive this process as well. Okay, so then if I go, I'm going to erase these notes. So you got them, you can always put pause on. Okay, so then we want to look at a few more things, and we're also going to look at this last one here. We're not going to look at that last part. But, uh, so, one thing we're going to pay attention to when we look at organisms in our, uh, when we're doing the dissections, is symmetry. And that's how the body's set up. And there's really, really two types is better. Remember? 
because the one type is no symmetry, but you have radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry. So radial symmetry is like a wheel, and you have the center part, and the rest of the body parts come off like spokes in a wheel. And that's called radial symmetry, like a radial tire. Okay, so, and uh, we'll see when we're doing this that we have some organisms, not a lot of them. A real good example is a sea star. You know, like it has little arms on it. It has a central body. You'll see that central disc it has in the middle. And then the arms are coming off the side like this, off the middle like this. That's radial symmetry. But then we have, like, humans. I'll try to draw this. I don't know if I can do it or not. It's not going to be the greatest drawing. Maybe alien-like. Okay, so there's a human, and we have something called bilateral, two sides. So if you took a human and you cut them down the middle like that, they would have, we would have bilateral symmetry, which means we have a right and a left. And you have right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, and even you have lungs, right lung, left lung. Uh, you have actually on the wrong side, but Switch these. And uh, right eye, left eye, even, not, even your nose, right nostril, left nostril, your heart, even though it's on one side, it has a right side and a left side. And then you have kidneys, the right and the left. Uh, you have some organs that don't quite follow it, but even your brain up here, it has a right and a left side as well. So humans have very complex bilateral symmetry. Not every organism is, is com as complex with the symmetry as we are, but usually the more complex the organism, the more complex the symmetry becomes. Okay. And then you have something called asymmetry, which is uh, no symmetry at all. So there's a few organisms. In fact, the first organism we watch, we're going to see that it doesn't have any symmetry really. And so that's our notes on animals, and hopefully you were able to hear that nice, and uh, I'll talk to you or I hope you guys if you're going to I don't know if you guys are going to music fest or not if you are I'll see you next week if not I'll see you Thursday have a good day